Well, thank you, ladies. You'll, uh, you may never know what uh, joy it brings to a pastor to hear the church praying for each other. Uh, there's a lot of, whenever somebody needs to be prayed for, they always call the pastor, right? I've always had sort of this thing about, well, what's so special about my prayers that's different from yours? And I'm still not quite clear on what that is, but I enjoy hearing you pray for each other, and I'm more than happy to pray for you as well. Um, but anyway, we come to a passage in 1 Timothy that's kind of written by Paul to a pastor. So it's kind of personal for me, and I want to share just kind of some... Uh, I would guess I would call it my view of pastor. I think I do this every once in a while. It seems not, not too long ago we did this. But uh, there's a quote on uh, the wall. I have several quotes on the wall in my office that are kind of meant to remind me or encourage me in ministry. And one of them says this. Much of pastoral ministry is simply reminding your people who they are in Christ again and again. Uh, and I always use that, um, usually on Monday mornings, you know, you'll... Uh, Monday morning is probably the worst time for pastors because they're reviewing what happened the day before and how well or how poorly it went. And there's a lot of pastors, there's a saying among pastors, don't quit on a Monday. Uh, and that's probably true for a lot of other people as well around the world. But uh, for us, pastors, Monday is, is can be a very hard, difficult day. If it didn't go as well as you had planned for it to go that whole week, you can really dig in. So I have this quote on my, my wall to remind me that how, how simple ultimately pastoral ministry is. And really, this is kind of the thesis of what Paul is saying to Timothy here in just these few five or six verses. We're in 1 Timothy chapter 4, uh, verses 11 to 16. And I'm, I titled this Practical Pastoring um, because there's a lot that you can think is involved in pastoring, but it really, if you try to keep it simple, it's much, it's much better that way. You know, it won't be as stressful for you. And we're going to hit on some of those things today. But Paul starts by writing to Timothy in verse 11 of 1 Timothy chapter 4. He says, command and teach these things. Now, in most versions, the word is command there. Paul's trying to get Timothy to establish some sense of authority to that church that he's leading. Uh, and there's no doubt that pastoring in just the 15 years that I've been here, it has changed dramatically, especially in the last two years. But even from the time I started back in, uh, I guess I started in ministry probably in 97, um, and it's changed. I can't even imagine how. I can't even think back that far. But just in the time that I've been here for 15 years or so, it has changed dramatically. Uh, and certainly one of the things that has changed, and maybe you wouldn't, you wouldn't know this, but that is the respect for pastors. Uh, it used to be that, and I can remember this time, that the pastor was one of the most respected people in the community. Man, now maybe I'm going back to Little House on the Prairie days where... The, the, the minister, you remember the old minister in Little House on the Prairie, that he was the most educated, most loved, respected figure in that community. I'm not asking that we go back to that, but there, at one time there was a measure of respect for the pastors. I can go back and look at uh, pictures of this church when it was first started, and I can see the respect that they had for the pastor. For example, there's still furniture in my office that I know was there from day one, uh, and it's the, there's some massive pieces of furniture in there. I'm like, well, they really... There was this idea of authority. The preacher preached from up here, right? Some of you can remember that. There used to be a choir loft back here. And there was this idea he'd have a big pulpit. And there was this authority of him bringing down the Word of God. Well, we've lost a lot of that. And that's kind of what I'm reminding us today, that there's still that idea and then that calling and that identity that Paul's giving to Timothy here. I want to read you a quote that I saw this week about this idea of pastoral authority uh, in their community. Uh, and now a lot of that, that, especially in media coverage that we see, the pastors that we see is because there's been some scandal or controversy or an affair or adultery and they've been removed from the pulpit. Now you'd think, uh, and maybe I see it more than you do, but you'd think that that is so prevalent in mega churches, right? I saw a statistic, I, and if you really want me to, I'll find it. I couldn't remember where I saw it, but this, I think I talked about this not too long ago. The actual statistic is, is that less than 5% of mega church pastors end up in scandal or controversy. Now, if you'd watch the news, you'd think it's like 85, 90%, right? It's less than 5%. Now, we've allowed uh, just this, this age of information and media that we live in to afflict and inflict the way that we think about the church. And that has, that has decreased pastoral authority a little bit. But let me read you this quote. Pastors do not hold the place of community esteem they once did. According to Barna's state of pastors report this is 2017 only about one in five americans thinks of a pastor as very influential in their community and about one in four doesn't think they're very influential or influential at all 
The truth is, influential or not, many Americans don't want to hear what pastors have to say. In 2016, Barna found that only 21% of Americans consider pastors to be very credible on the important issues of our day. Even among those that Barna defined as evangelicals, the number only rises to slightly over half. So people that identify themselves as evangelicals, only half of them think that pastors are credible on the issues of the day. Think about it. Nearly half of American evangelicals don't see their pastors as being an authoritative voice for navigating current affairs. And I thought, what a shame. Uh, isn't that one of the, the roles of the pastor is to take scripture and apply it to the world that we live in? And that's one of the things that we try to do on those Tuesday and Thursday devotionals as well. But you remember this, that this was not only something that for our day, but every time Paul wrote a letter to a church, not every time, almost every time, he calls himself an apostle. That means he is establishing his authority as someone called by God. On several occasions in his letters, he writes his background that he was raised Jewish, you know, and, and was taught by, I can't remember the guys, the, the, the Jewish teacher that he followed. But every time he calls himself an apostle, he's establishing his authority. And he starts this letter to Timothy that same way. He says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the command of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus. You hear that call of authority that Paul says, I'm writing you this letter as an apostle called by God and he establishes that. He does that in a lot of letters. And one of the, one of the things that he's going to try to instill in Timothy and we realize that Timothy has this idea that he's timid. We get it through other places, that, that other things that Paul says to him. And Paul's trying to kind of buck him up and says, command and teach these things. Look at verse 12. Now he's kind of building on this theme. Don't let anyone despise your youth. Now I remember when I was young in ministry, this was my favorite verse in scripture. Because when you first start out in, in ministry, there's, there are huge feelings of inadequacy when you're trying to minister, especially to people that are older than you are. But now at this point, I'm doing it for most of my life. But when you're, especially when you're young in your 20s and early 30s, and you're trying to minister to people that are older than you are, there's this sense of, who am I to tell them anything? You know, I mean, what do I know? But there's also, there's, there's a part of this that probably on this side of it you don't comprehend but it's the same thing as Paul being called as an apostle when God calls someone to ministry frankly there's nothing else that you'll be able to do if you run away from that call I've shared that with you on several occasions and it seems that one of the reasons that Timothy was timid may have been because of his youth now some commentators suggest oh he was probably in his mid 30s I was 35 years old when I first started pastoring this church and I felt completely inadequate at that point sometimes I still do today but that's what Paul is saying to Timothy. And perhaps Timothy's philosophy was the same. You remember the story of Job where he has his three friends that they come and they kind of rebuke Job. Well, there's a fourth guy in that story whose name is Elihu. And this is, I want this on the screen for you. This is in Job chapter 32. Here's what he says. So Elihu, son of Barakel, the Buzzite said, I am young in years and you are old. That is why I was fearful. He, he goes last in the, in the procession of Job's friends. Not daring to tell you what I know. I thought age should speak. Advanced years should teach wisdom. And then he changes it right here in verse 8. But it is the spirit in a man. The breath of the Almighty that gives him understanding. It is not only the old who are wise. Not only the aged who understand what is right. It has taken me many years to understand that when God has called someone into ministry, there's a sense of authority. Not only authority, but responsibility that come with that. So when I stand in this pulpit, I take it very seriously. And whoever I let speak from this pulpit has been interviewed by me on more than one occasion or I know them personally because there's a measure of authority that comes from standing here on a Sunday morning worship service admonishing you saying, thus saith the Lord. And you can probably go back to some of your churches and remember you feel that voice of a, a pastor has this big booming voice and you felt that as he was speaking to you, it was the very words of God. And that's what Paul is trying to give to Timothy. And Timothy probably has this sense of an inadequacy in his calling. If he's truly as young as it seems, and he's really timid, he's got those two strikes on him already. There's probably a sense of unworthiness and inability and his fear of failure or who am I to preach these people and lead this church? And these things are compounded when you're young. And when you believe that God has called you to this thing and you sense the importance of it. I read a story a few weeks ago um, you may not know the author, but the story is told by Neil Gaiman, who was, uh, he is, 
uh, kind of a legendary author, most of science, science fiction, so you may not be familiar with him, but he's a, a well-known author. And it says that he talked about being at, at a gathering of successful people from many walks of life and feeling that he didn't belong there. And he stood at the back of the hall and he started chatting with an elderly man who happened to have the same first name. And the old man pointed to all the talented guests and said, I just look at all these people and think, what in the world am I doing here? They've made amazing things. I just went where I was sent. And Neil Gaiman responded, yes, but you were the first man on the moon. I think that counts for something. And Neil Gaiman concluded, and I felt a bit better because if Neil Armstrong felt like an imposter, maybe everyone did. Maybe there weren't any grown-ups, only people who had worked hard and also got lucky and were slightly out of their depth. All of us doing the best job we could, which is all we can really hope for. So maybe that's you today, not just talking about myself and how I felt when I first started in ministry, but maybe you feel beyond your depth and your job or whatever it is that is that's going on in your life right now and you're just not capable and you're not up to that. Here's the deal. God not only calls pastors, he's called you to that life that he has given you. He has led you into this situation that you have right now and he's going to lead you on through that. Now I don't think that Paul suffered from this same inferiority complex that Timothy because Paul is very bold at times and able to stand up for himself but he wants Timothy to understand the calling that is on his life and the authority that comes along with that he continues on here in verse 12 but set an example for the believers in speech in conduct in love in faith and in purity now there's five things here and I'm not going to spend a lot of time because I think they're they're self-explanatory and once again, as it was with deacons and elders earlier in, in Paul's letter to Timothy, his concern here is more about character. He doesn't have a 17-page job description. Timothy, when you lead the church, do A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and all this list of things. Paul's description is very different from those descriptions. Sometimes, just for fun, I read what churches, who they're hiring, who they're looking for, and I'm like, there's no way you're ever going to find this person. Because nobody can measure up to some of the qualifications that churches put on there sometimes. Paul keeps it really simple. Be an example. In conduct, in speech, in love, in faith, in purity. He lists five areas in which Timothy is to focus on. And there's probably a lot of scripture references that pastors, and that, excuse me, that churches use when they're calling pastors. But really this would be a great place to start. Be an example. And if you don't start with, if you haven't started living your life as an example, there's no other place to start. Be an example in speech is what the pastor says consistent with Scripture. Be an example in conduct. If your speech is consistent with Scripture, then is your conduct consistent with your speech? Be an example in love. Jesus said a lot about that. Does your pastor look like what Jesus described in the Gospels? Be an example in faith and in purity. It's really, uh, we should go beyond applying these to pastors. These are great examples for anyone who claims to be a follower of Christ. Let's read it again to ourselves. For the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Just take those five things and put, uh, look at your list this week. How did you do in those five things this last week? And now Paul shifts from Timothy's character and it gives a little bit of his duties here. He says, until I come, until I come to be at your church, Timothy, give your attention to public reading, exhortation, and teaching. He gives them a pattern for worship. Now, as we were praying in our groups this morning, this verse was going through my mind, and I thought, Paul left off prayer as a public pattern of worship. I'm like, where is that? Now, we know from Acts 2 and other places that prayer was a part of the early church. But for Timothy, he says, Here's, I want you to give your attention to these things, to public reading, you're reading the scriptures, to exhortation, you're encouraging the people and teaching them. You're explaining what the scripture means. And maybe those are three things specifically that Timothy needed to, to focus on. Maybe those weren't his strengths and Paul knew that. Now even as we gathered here this morning, I doubt, I seriously doubt that anyone puts as much thought into a church service as a worship pastor and the pastor. In fact, I'm so confident of that because this is what I do full time think about what's going to happen in this room I do remember days growing up in church where you just showed up at church you didn't put a single bit of thought into going in and maybe that's true for some of you I do remember those days although it was so long ago when I was a kid 
But those who plan the service are so focused on everything. Like exam like example this morning, I can tell you how many typos are in our bulletin. Because I typed the thing out. I know how many there were when I started and how many when I finished. But Paul says, these things are the key focus of the church. They're a priority. And when the church is gathered, this is what you do. And in the last few years, I want to cover three or four things here. Just a couple things that popped into my mind because I think about constantly what the church is, what is becoming, what it is supposed to be, what we are to be doing when we're gathered. But in the last few years, we've had to rethink and refocus what are the priorities of the church. And there was a time where we had all these health restrictions and quarantines, right? And we couldn't meet together. And every church was scrambling to figure out, okay, what do we do when we can't gather like this? And it caused pastors and church leaders to think about, okay, what is it that is essential about what we do here? And the first obvious thing was everybody started streaming their services, right? We went online. We went on Facebook and whatever it may be. And the big churches were miles ahead of the small churches because they'd been doing it for years. But first off, not only did these worship services become necessary but now they've become popular and there's two things there's two things that I'm going to give you are related people of all ages and I was talking to some in this congregation people of it's not just younger people that are comfortable streaming it's older people as well they're comfortable getting their spiritual substance online now this is both good and bad there's a lot of good stuff out there a lot of, of positive Christ serving Christ loving churches and people and pastors streaming stuff there's also a lot of junk out there. And not all of it is good teaching, as Paul would talk about in his letter to Timothy here. And in the last two years, as we began to examine ourselves, and we began streaming, and we looked at the culture around us, and streaming became so popular, we began to talk about how is the church's role perceived in our culture? How is it, how, how do we be more effective? But churches have not only had lockdowns and quarantines and financial constraints, but streaming was partly to the way that we have noticed the shifts in attendance. It used to be when someone was a regular at church, that meant they were there every Sunday. That's not true anymore. Studies have shown, and I'll send you the, you can see the, the stats tomorrow in the email, that even the regular people are there one or two times a month. Now, I'm not saying good or bad. I'm just saying it is what it is. And this is what we've had to realize as pastors as we try to lead our churches and we've we've entered into the streaming world well, how do we call people back to this idea of God and some do it better than others and I'll still say that streaming is never going to measure up to what happened in this church earlier this morning things that we don't stream well, there's, and I'm intentional about this there's parts of our services that we don't stream and we don't record because it is just for us when we pray together in groups that's not being recorded when we worship together, that is a, a thing that goes on in our body here. So I would say that you're automatically at a deficit if you're only streaming. Not trying to condemn those that only do that, just saying that you're missing something. But those who were considered regular attenders attend less frequently, and people who attended less frequently attend even less frequently. So those are two things that have changed, this idea of streaming and church attendance. Third thing that I want to talk about this morning is more and more pastors and churches have gone bivocational, meaning the pastor also works outside. He's not a full-time employee of the church. He works somewhere else. Now, a lot of times that begins for financial reasons, but there's also, I have, when I was early in this church, I mean, I missed, when I came in from working full-time driving a truck, I missed having those relationships with people outside the church. And I think I've shared that with you on occasions that as a pastor, I always get spiritual talk from people about what they expect and what they think they're going to hear from me. And I don't get genuine heart-shared needs and hurts because, oh, it's a pastor. First thing they say to the pastor is, oh, sorry, I apologize for the language. And the second thing is, is you get the preacher speech. About, oh, here's what I think about ministry. And it's all just this planned thing. You're not actually meeting the real person. But more and more pastors have gone bivocational, not only for financial reasons, but also because they cherish those relationships outside their church building. And I truly think that if we are headed, if the church in America is headed into times of greater difficulty and a measure of persecution, that we're going to see more and more pastors go bivocational. If the church is being pruned and it becomes smaller, if it becomes more segregated and isolated from our culture, that's going to be a different possibility. And it's been on my heart from time to time and more often lately that, hey, maybe I need to think about this again. Because 
What if a pastor, first off, we talked about his, his influence in the community is diminished. How do we strengthen that? We put him in the community, right? Well, the pastor's influence in our culture may be gone because he's in his office or he's working with church people all the time. He doesn't have that influence in the community because nobody knows who he is if they don't go to his church. I heard a sermon um, several years ago. It was at a, some kind of conference and the pastor was going back and he, he used a, the passage of Jesus walking on the water and, and one of the miracles where he... Um, he fed the people. And I can't remember how he got there, but the point was is that the church in America is going to the point where the New Testament church like looked like. Do you remember what Paul's bivocational job was? He only says that I think in one place in Scripture. Paul made tents, right? I, I'm assuming that Timothy was probably bivocational. This is before the church became this big thing where we hired full-time pastors to worry about what we do on a Sunday. They were probably all bivocational. And Paul was the one who wrote 17, I think it's 17 letters of our scripture. He himself was bivocational. One of the things that comes along with this shifting role of pastors and being bivocational and resorting our, pri re resorting our priorities. I have to admit that pastoring has been very hard in the last few years. Not just being one from the technological side, but from the, the depths of hurt that people are experiencing and the mental health struggles the sin and the evil in the world and the racism and all the things we see around us. It's hard to counsel people when, there's, when the needs seem to be going greater and greater and greater. When you're standing here holding up a candle in the midst and the world just seems to get darker and darker. You kind of wonder, God, am I really cut out for this? You want to take a step back and say, what am I doing? And then you read what Paul says to Timothy. He says, no, Timothy, command and teach these things. Set an example. Regardless of the culture you live in, regardless of how it's changed, regardless of how the church has changed, you have a call and a command to get up there and do this. And it's not just been harder for me, but a lot of pastors would say that it's been harder. There's been a lot of division both in and outside the church. And churches and their sizes and their structure have changed. I could give you a list of churches right now that are looking for pastors and have been for a long time. It's not easy out there right now. And some churches are still uncertain of who they are. And methods and attendance and mediums of proclaiming the message have all changed, but the focus of worship and the clarity and the consistency of the gospel are still the same And God's people said. So if you take nothing else today, if all you heard was me up here complaining about how hard it's been and what it's like to try to lead a church, don't pay attention to that. Listen to this. The clarity in the communication of the gospel is still our number one priority. And God has commanded us to go out and set an example and to teach these things. And there you go, you can go home. Right? That's the one thing we want to get. Because that's what Paul is saying to Timothy here. He says, Paul, he says, Timothy, I don't care how hard it is, you command and teach these things. Set an example. Focus on this public teaching, exhortation, and encouragement through the word. And then having done that, you'll be good and faithful. And now he gets really personal here in verse 14 with Timothy. He says, despite the hardship, even with all that has changed, Paul says this to Timothy. I don't know what Timothy did before, but I'm, I'm wondering how, how far of a reach this new calling was for him. He says in verse 14, Timothy, don't neglect the gift that is in you. He says, I've noticed there's something good in you. God has given you a gift to use. It was given to you through prophecy with the laying on of hands by the council of elders. He says, Timothy, you have this responsibility. You have this calling. It was confirmed when we stood around you and we laid hands and we prayed on you. And I have to admit, I don't think very often back to when I was ordained. It's been many years ago now. But as I was reading this passage this week, I can remember where I was standing and who was there at my ordination. And it was a group of elders in the church I was serving stood around, placed their hands on me and prayed over Tanya and I. And that was an encouragement to me this week to remind me about that calling, that confirmation that I had that this group of men who I respected had said, yeah, we see there's a gift in you and we think you need to move forward with this aspect of your life and move forward in ministry. So after you get that calling and that confirmation clear, who are you to step back and say, well, I don't know about this. When God has said, and when God's leaders and elders in a church have said, no, we think you ought to do this, Shame on you if you can't, or you don't. Paul continues on to Timothy. Practice these things. 
Be committed to them so that your progress may be evident to all. We should all be making progress and stepping towards Christ-likeness. Unfortunately, we don't all go at the same speed or at the same time. Sometimes it's so frustrating as a pastor to see that happen in the lives of others. It seems like they're making progress and then all of a sudden there's a setback and they've taken two steps backwards and then one step forward. And then sometimes as a pastor, you see it in yourself that I thought we were here as a church or I thought I was here on my walk with Christ and it turns out I'm not that far. Or maybe I've felt like I've been going backwards. I wonder if the, if the church of Ephesus saw Timothy progress in faith and faithfulness. How long was he there? If he started when he was young, how many years did he serve in this church? Did they see him moving forward? Did he grow in wisdom and compassion and speech and all those things that Paul listed? And we can see clearly that Paul finds some room for growth in Timothy's boldness in the faith. Look at verse 16. It says, pay close attention to your life and your teaching. Persevere in these things. You don't get an opportunity to step back. You persevere in those things. For in doing this, you will save both yourself and your hearers. I read a quote this week that I wanted to share with you, and I'm, I'm going to put it after this point because we've been talking about how we go, what we think about when we come together to worship. Um, maybe I should have talked about this when I was talking about the streaming, but the quote says this, that isolation from other Christians has lethal impact on private Bible reading. They've done studies about how often people read their Bible. And during the pandemic, they found out that people did not read their Bible more. They read it less. That's what the studies are showing. It says, when people are not in church, they're not reminded of the blessings of Scripture and its importance for their lives. And they aren't encouraged by other Christians sharing about their own Bible reading. That's one of the reasons we break up into prayer groups. We want you to pray and be there to encourage each other. And here, there's, there's many, many stories about pastors. And I can still remember some of the ones that I was in church under. You probably have some of your own. And you probably have some good stories. Last week, I concluded with a, uh, a story from a book. I'm going to read from the same book. It was called, What is a Mother? Last Sunday was Mother's Day. And this week, I was looking for, I wanted to end with a story about pastors. And just a few pages after motherhood was pastors. And there's a story in there called, What is a Pastor? So I want to conclude, I want to read that, and then I want us to go back and read these verses again. Um, but I want to read this part first. What is a pastor? If the pastor is young, they say he lacks experience. If his hair is gray, He's getting too old for the young people. If he has five children, he has too many. If he has no children, he's setting a bad example. If he preaches from his notes, he has canned sermons and he's dry. And if his, message are, if his messages are extemporaneous, he isn't deep. If he's attentive to the poor people of the church, they claim he's playing to the grandstand. If he pays attention to the wealthy, he's trying to be an aristocrat. If he uses too many illustrations, he neglects the text. If he doesn't use enough stories, he isn't clear. If he condemns wrong, he's cranky. If he doesn't preach against sin, he's a compromiser. If he preaches the truth, he's offensive. If he doesn't preach the truth, he's a hypocrite. If he fails to please everybody, he's hurting the church and ought to leave. If he does please everybody, he has no convictions. If he drives an old car, he shames his congregation. If he drives a new car, he's setting his affection on earthly things. If he preaches all the time, then the people get tired of hearing one man. If he invites guest preachers, he's shirking his responsibility. If he receives a large salary, he's a mercenary. If he receives a small salary, well, they say he isn't worth much anyway. I wanted to share that not because I feel any of those things because I want you to feel the tension that it is to try to pastor a church and certainly what Timothy must have felt and the reason that Paul has to write to him these words. 
command and teach these things. Be an example to the people. It can be incredibly complicated. The world that we live in can be incredibly complicated. We have more information and technology and ways to do and accomplish things and things that we want to do than can possibly be done in a lifetime. We have to, as the people of God, as the pastor of a church, we have to keep coming back to the simplicity of Scripture and doing what God has asked us to do and being faithful in those things. And God's people said... I want, to re- I want to conclude today by reading these, that same set of verses that we read, 1 Timothy 4, 11 to 16, from the message. So take this as the message to you today as well. Get the word out. Teach all these things. And don't let anyone put you down because you're young. Teach believers with your life, by word, by demeanor, by love, by faith, by integrity. Stay at your post, reading scripture, giving counsel, teaching. And that special gift of ministry you were given when the leaders of the church laid hands on you and prayed, keep that dusted off and in use. Cultivate these things. Immerse yourself in them. The people will all see you mature right before their eyes. Keep a firm grasp on both your character and your teaching. Don't be diverted. Just keep at it. Both you and those who hear you will experience salvation. May you experience and bless others with the joy of the Lord and his salvation this week. And God's people said, Amen. God bless you. Have a great week.